before we go on. Whenever God calls men of faith to leadership responsibilities, whether they be in the home, in the workplace, at church, or in the community, they must always expect the enemy to bring about certain obstacles. Our seminar is entitled, No Compromise, subtitled, Standing Firm Under Pressure. Let me give you a quick summary before we go on. Whenever God calls men of faith to leadership responsibilities, whether they be in the home, in the workplace, at church, or in the community, they must always expect the enemy to bring about certain obstacles. Today, we are going to study, it's going to be a fascinating study from the book of Nehemiah on the strategies of Satan. Every single strategy Satan will throw at us is covered in this book. And we are going to conclude by saying, whatever the obstacles and challenges are, we must remain firm, loyal, and uncompromising. Let me begin by giving a quick overview of the book of Nehemiah, just in case. In my opinion, this is one of the best books every Seventh-day Adventist leader must study carefully. We do study this book. We spend about two weeks every day, three hours, studying this book. You know, I'm directing secular campus ministries for the Michigan Conference, and the Lord has blessed us with many godly leaders. This book has been one of the books that has transformed their lives, and Today, I'm going to briefly share with you some snippets from this book, and I trust you would study them in your own time. A quick overview of the book of Nehemiah. There are only 13 chapters. The book begins with prayer and ends with prayer. And you are going to see how prayer punctuates this book. Men of faith are men of prayer. Let's look quickly at chapter 1. Nehemiah chapter 1 briefly discusses the call of Nehemiah. You already know the book of Nehemiah discusses how Nehemiah rebuilt the walls of Jerusalem, walls that have laid in ruins for 110 years. And yet this man, coming all the way from Babylon, from Persia, within 52 days got the job done. How did he do it? That's what this book is all about. But you are going to discover the book of Nehemiah is not only about building up broken walls, it is about building up people. The book presents leadership par excellence, what it means to be a leader. When God calls you, the steps he takes you through, and how you remain faithful and loyal till the work is done. In chapter 1, we're going to discover the call of Nehemiah. How do you know God has called you? That is chapter 1. Chapter 2 discusses planning for God's work. When God calls you for a mission, whatever that mission is, you need to plan for it. Chapter 2 covers it. Chapter 3 discusses how to work your plan. Having planned your work, how do you make it work? There we are going to see how Nehemiah actually brings people together and executes the work. In chapter 4, we are going to discuss or we are going to find out how he built under opposition. Whenever there is motion, there is always friction. Nehemiah got started and then there was opposition. That is chapter 4. Chapter 5, we had problems from within. Opposition doesn't always come from outside. There are problems within. In my opinion, chapter 5 is perhaps the best part of the book. We are not going to study it today. But how do you respond to internal crisis? Chapter 6, which will be the bulk of our study this morning, discusses how Satan seeks to compromise us when the work is almost done. And then chapter 7, Nehemiah is done with the work. 
And we are going to discover, or the Bible is going to show that the house or the city was large, but no one was living in. Nehemiah wanted some people to dwell in that city. How did he get into doing that? Chapter 7 discusses all of this. In chapter 8, there's a revival. He calls Ezra, the prophet, or the, the scribe and the priest, to lead out in a revival meeting. And there, if we have time, we are going to discover true revival is always a Bible-based effort. And that's what Nehemiah chapter 8 is about. Nehemiah chapter 9 is the longest prayer in the Bible. It's part of the revival. And then after that, in chapter 10 and 11, there was an appeal and people dedicated their lives to God and Nehemiah made a request. We need volunteers to come and live in the city. And then the city was inhabited. Nehemiah reigned in Jerusalem for 12 years. After that, he went back to Persia, to Babylon. Sometimes they are used interchangeably because Babylon was conquered by the Medo-Persians, so sometimes it is referred to as Babylon, but it's Medo-Persia, basically Persia. He goes back to Persia. While he was gone, the Bible tells us there was apostasy in Israel. And so chapter 13 discusses how Nehemiah came back and righted the wrong. This gives you a quick overview of the book of Nehemiah. But for now, we are going to study about the strategies of the enemy. As soon as God calls you to any responsibility, to any duty, there is always bound to be opposition. Satan has crafted certain obstacles, certain deceptions, certain means by which he is going to frustrate God's plan for our lives. And we are going to look at them Focusing especially in chapter 6. On your handout, which you have in your hands, I will briefly go over it with you. The first introductory part basically tells you what the book of Nehemiah is all about and how we are going to discover how we should respond to the strategies of the enemy. I've given you a summary of the book. And then the second paragraph, strategies of the enemy. And there I have in your handouts this statement. God's blessings are always met by Satan's anger and opposition. Spiritual leaders need great courage when the going gets rough. Through the incessant activities of Nehemiah's enemies, and there are four major enemies we are going to see. The first one is called Sambalat, Tobiah, Geshem, and then there is a fourth called the Ashdodites. These are from the land of the Philistines. From the book of Nehemiah, we are going to see these enemies represent Satan in his opposition to God's work. Let me give you a quick map. Let's say Palestine is the palm of my hand. That is where Nehemiah was, Jerusalem rebuilding the wall. On the north is Samaria. That is where Sambalat was. Sambalat was a governor of the north. He was one enemy of Nehemiah. On the east where we have the Moabites and the Ammonites, we have Tobiah. You come across him and you get to see his role in this effort. On the east. On the south, the Arabs, or a man by the name Geshem, he is over there. And then on the west is a gentleman, or actually a, a group of people, the Ashdodites, from Ashdod, the Philistines. So Nehemiah was literally surrounded by the enemy. The message for us, if God has called you as a man of faith, you need to be aware that you are surrounded by enemies. Satan is a relentless foe, and we are going to watch how he sought to trip Nehemiah. Before we go any further, let's bow our heads for prayer. Our Father, in the next few minutes, we invite you to speak to us. Open our eyes to the subtleties of the enemy, and may we rise from here, determined by your grace to stand loyal, without compromise, in the pursuit and execution of the task you have entrusted in our care. Speak to us through your word, for we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Take your Bibles and turn to Nehemiah chapter 6. Nehemiah chapter 6. 
I chose the title for this seminar, No Compromise, from this chapter. Verse 1 says, Now it came to pass, when Sambalat and Tobiah and Geshem, the Arabian, you can see all the three enemies are listed here. Sambalat, Tobiah, and Geshem, the Arabian, and the rest of our enemies, a reference to the Ashdodites, the Philistines, heard that I had built the wall, and that there was no breach left therein, though at that time I had not yet set up the doors upon the gates, then Sambalat and Geshem sent unto me, saying, Come, let us meet together. This phrase, come, let us meet together, was actually a call for compromise. If you jump to verse 7, the very last line of verse 7, you'll find another one. Come, therefore, let us take counsel together. And then if you jump to verse 10, right about the middle of that verse, there is a statement, let us meet together. This chapter is increasingly filled with an invitation. Nehemiah, suspend what you are doing. Come, let us meet together. These invitations are actually a call for compromise. To understand this, we need to get a little back to see what strategies they had used before, which never worked, and why they resorted to this. This chapter would be our study, but you need to get a little background. And so, in your handout, I have strategies of the enemy. And I list five previous attempts to compromise Nehemiah from doing the work God has called him to do. Turn to chapter 2 and verse 10. Nehemiah chapter 2 and verse 10. In chapter 1, God called Nehemiah, I want you to go to Jerusalem and rebuild the broken walls. In chapter 2, the Lord at the appropriate time opened the way. Nehemiah made a request to the king, King Atazizis, and he gave him permission, go and build. As soon as Nehemiah set forth towards Jerusalem, opposition started. Nehemiah chapter 2, perhaps we read from verse 9 and 10. Then I came to the governors beyond the river, and I gave them the king's letters. Now the king had sent captains of the army and horsemen with me. Verse 10. When Sambalat the Horonite, the same as the Samaritan, the Samarian, when Sambalat the Horonite and Tobiah the servant, the Ammonite, heard of it, it grieved them exceedingly that there was come a man to seek the welfare of the children of Israel. Point number one. Nehemiah has not even arrived in Jerusalem yet. And yet Satan started planning against him. As soon as these enemies heard that someone had come all the way from Persia to come and restore the broken walls, they were upset. Brothers, any time God lays his hands on you to do a mighty work for him, whether it is in the home, whether it is in the church, whether it is in the workplace or in the community, even before you get started, be aware the enemy is upset with you. It has never been the intention of Satan to be interested in the welfare of people. And so when he sees men and women raised by God to fulfill a duty, he gets upset. Have no illusion, we are dealing with a relentless foe. If that is clear, say amen. amen. He hasn't even gotten there, and Satan was planning. The remainder of chapter 2 tells us, Nehemiah got to Jerusalem. He surveyed the scene, and then finally, he calls the people. Folks, the walls are broken. The gates have been burned. Come, let us build. He motivated them. And then, getting to the end of that chapter, verse 18, the people all said, yes, let us rise and build. They were inspired by this man of God. And so they said, we are going to do it. As soon as they decided to build, verse 19, but, the word but is a very interesting one, but, 
When Sambalat, the Horonite, and Tobiah the seventh, and the Ammonite, and Geshem, the Arabian, heard it, they laughed us to scorn and despised us and said, What is this thing that you do? Will you rebel against the king? As soon as you rally your troops, pull your resources together to begin the work, whether it is literature ministry, whether it is Sabbath school, whether it is some major work God has called you to do, as soon as you assemble the resources, Satan gets upset. And he begins with skepticism. Skepticism is one way Satan tries to undermine us. There is more there, but I'm, I'm moving on because I want to get to chapter 6. But this did not stop Nehemiah. In fact, he responded in verse 20, Then I answered them, saying, The God of heaven, he will prosper us. Therefore, we, his servants, will arise and build, but you have no portion. My point, any time, as you rally your troops together to do the work, and there begins opposition, encourage yourself in the fact that God will prosper you. He who has called you will bring the work to pass. In chapter 3, Nehemiah begins. He arranged them. This is one of the most fascinating chapters. It has a list of names and we tend to skip them. But if you analyze it, you are going to discover three kinds of builders. He rallies them all together. He used every man, men, boys, little kids, women. Everyone was involved. And the work started. Then you come to chapter 4. The next step of the enemy. The enemy couldn't stop him from coming. He couldn't stop the motivated people from beginning the work. And then in chapter 4, when the work began and it was halfway, Satan came with another one. Chapter 4. It came to pass when Sambalat heard that we built the wall, he was wroth and took great indignation and mocked the Jews. And he spoke before his brethren and the army of Samaria and said, What do these feeble Jews, will they fortify themselves? Will they sacrifice? Will they make an end? Will they revive the stones out of the heaps of rubbish which are burned? Now Tobiah the Ammonite was with him. And he said, Even if a fox goes up on it, the whole thing would collapse. I put in your notes over there, ridicule, cynicism, and contempt. See, when Satan cannot stop you from the work, and the work begins, he always uses cynicism, ridicule, or mockery. Many people have failed in the pursuit of their duty because of cynicism. It is one plan of the enemy. You can't do it. You feeble Jews. What makes you think you can do it? You have no education, you have no money, you are this, you are that, you cannot do it. Nehemiah was determined in verse 4. He responded to this by saying, Hear, O God, for we are despised and turn their reproach upon their head. This is an injection of prayer. When you are taunted, your first response is, Submit the case to the Lord. Prayer. And then he continued building. When the enemy saw they couldn't stop him, if you keep reading, they decided a frontal attack. They sent messengers telling Nehemiah and the people, we are coming to attack you, we are going to destroy you. And they, getting to the end of the chapter, you are going to discover the people got so discouraged. Because those who were coming to work were saying, Lord, they are coming to kill us, they are coming to kill us, they are coming to kill us. That was when Nehemiah halted for a moment, reorganized the people, put them in their various places, some holding spears, some holding, you know, uh, whatever they could, doing the work. You must never stop the work, even in the face of threat. Physical attack is one means Satan uses. Uh, I wish I had time to talk about spiritual warfare. This is the battle plan being laid out for us so that we can learn from it. Psychological warfare didn't do it when they ridiculed him. Now physical attack. But Nehemiah refused to be daunted. He continued building the wall. And then, chapter 5, problem emerged in the camp. The women, the girls, everyone started crying because there was economic problem. Finances are another means Satan uses. And there, Nehemiah emerged triumphantly in, in a mighty way. One day I'll be preaching a sermon on it. It's, it's a fascinating uh, chapter. But now that you have this background... Let's look at chapter 6. Chapter 6. We are going to discover four compromises. 
Let's look again at what time this came, verse 1. You've seen the rise of the building. Satan couldn't stop it. Now it is about to be completed. Verse 1 again. Now it came to pass when Sambalat and Tobiah and Geshem, the Arabian, and the rest of our enemies heard that I had built the wall, that there was no breach left therein, though at that time I hadn't set up the doors upon the gates, that Sambalat, Geshem, sent unto me, saying, Come, let us meet together in some of the villages in the plain of Ono, but they thought to do me mischief. At what time or at what juncture of the building phase did this temptation come? At the end. You see, Satan reserved his most serious attack to the very end. He never gives up. Sometimes many of us have a certain feeling of euphoria at our successes. When you think you are most successful, that is when you are most vulnerable. Elijah, after a mountaintop experience, he fell. Peter, after walking on the water, he began to sink. David fell when God had made him prosperous one afternoon. Folks, when you are most successful at the work God has given you, that is the time you are most vulnerable. And here we see it. When the work was almost done and everyone was rejoicing, our enemies couldn't defeat us. That was when Satan came. And his strategy this time was, Nehemiah, I'm sorry we had a little misunderstanding the first time you came. I recognize we can live well as good neighbors. Come, let us meet together. It almost sounded like a friendly, magnanimous inv invitation. Come, let's talk. You know, in today's language, it is an ecumenical alliance. You Adventists, we tried to attack you. You were a cult. You were this. We know we had a little misunderstanding. But now, come, let us talk together. Let's enter into an alliance. Compromise, that is when it started. What was Satan's intent? He was very shrewd. He knew that if Nehemiah left Jerusalem to one of the plains of Ono, that's how the Bible calls it, O-N-O, to meet together, first of all, he would lose one day of work to travel. Then during the meeting, he would lose another day of work. And then after the meeting, he would lose another day of work going back. So he would lose three days. And three days were all that Satan needed to disrupt the work. It was a calculated ploy. Satan also knew if Nehemiah came to that meeting with all the enemies and he alone, they could compromise him. Never underestimate the power of influence. Today, many of us feel a need. We want to belong, especially Adventists. We want to belong so badly to the ecumenical crowd. We want to do what everyone is doing. Come, let's talk together. Be mindful of the plan of the enemy. And in your own life, in your personal life, you must translate this over there. And if during the meeting, Nehemiah refused to compromise, these individuals could have staged his murder. On his way back home, they could have staged a murder. And you know how the news goes. Then they would announce in the news of CNN, brothers and sisters, we are so sorry that Nehemiah died in a car accident. He was such a fine man. He came, he did what no one could do in 110 years. And during the latter phase of his work, he entered into dialogue for mutual understanding. And in fact, we came up with some agreement. It's so sad he had to die this way, but they staged it. Nehemiah knew what the enemy was up against. And so what was his response? Verse 3. And I sent messengers unto them saying, I am doing a great work so that I cannot come down. Why should the work cease whilst I leave it and come down to you. Our response anytime we are invited to this kind of meeting is, I cannot come down. I preached a sermon at the seminary some time ago. It's, a, it's a, almost a defiant title. 
come down for what? When God calls you to do some work, keep your eye always on the ball. There should be no compromise. Don't come down. I was speaking to our students at the University of Michigan, and uh, one of them was playing on the word ono. You know, he, Nehemiah was invited to the plane of ono, and one of the students said, anytime we are invited to come for this kind of dialogue, we should say, oh, no. <laughs> Never compromise. Keep on building. If that's clear, say amen. And so Nehemiah said, I'm sorry, I'm doing a great work for the job. I cannot come down. And so the messengers left with his message. Verse 4. Yet they sent unto me four times after this sort, and I answered them after the same manner. Think of pressure. Okay, brother Nehemiah, we understand why you cannot come down uh, this week. What about next week? I'm sorry, I'm doing a great job for the Lord. I cannot come down. Okay, what about the next two weeks? They kept putting pressure. Pressure to compromise. Satan never gives up. And neither should you. Four times and his response, I'm sorry, I'm doing a great work for the Lord. I cannot come down. If that is clear, say amen. amen. This strategy also failed. In fact, verse 5 says, Then sent Sambalat his servant unto me in like manner the fifth time with an open letter. That leads you to uh, the, the next point. The fifth time he changed his tactics. This time it was an open letter. I hope you, you didn't miss that one. An open letter. Let's read the content and then we'll explain. Then sent Sambala the servant unto me the like manner in the fifth time with an open letter in his hand, wherein was written, It is reported among the heathen, and Gashmu says it, that you and the Jews think to rebel, for which cause you build the wall, and you are make, uh, thou mayest be their king according to these words. And that thou hast also appointed prophets to preach of thee at Jerusalem, saying, There is a king in Judah, and now shall it be reported to the king according to these words. Come now, therefore, and let us take counsel together. What the enemies did was, they wrote an open letter. An open letter, basically, is like they published the letter on the internet for everyone to read. And the letter basically says, Nehemiah, it has been reported to us. And by the way, Geshem, the, Hebrew, uh, the Arabic name is written here, Geshem, Geshem, has confirmed it to us. You know how rumors, vicious rumors go. We have heard this. Oh, by the way, it has also been confirmed by Pastor Susu and so and Brother Susu and so, Dr. Susu and so. That you, Nehemiah, you are planning to stage a military takeover. Treason. You are planning to rebel against the king. And that you have even ordained some people to proclaim you king. But we don't believe this. Therefore, come. Let us talk. What do you do when vicious rumors are spread about you? When Satan cannot stop you, psychological warfare, physical attack and everything, one of the most effective means he uses is to malign your character, to impend your integrity by circulating false reports about you. And some of us got so subtle in this, we get so worried. They are saying this, I have to defend my honor. The time you take defending your honor or publishing your response, perhaps in some book, must we be silent, is always Satan's effort to divert you from your task. What was Nehemiah's response? Verse 8. Then I sent unto him, saying, There are no such things done as thou sayest, but thou finish them out of your hand, or from your heart. For they all made us afraid, saying, Their hands shall be weakened from the work that it be not done. Now therefore, O God, strengthen my hands. How do you respond to character assassination? First of all, he offered a prayer to God. Lord, they are discouraging, they are attacking, strengthen my hand. And then he briefly responded, you know that what you are saying is a lie. That was the end of the story. I'm sorry, I cannot respond to this. And then he kept on building. 
Don't waste your time to defend your name and integrity. God will do it for you. In fact, Ellen White tells us, and I, I didn't bring the quotation, she says, no one can ruin your life or destroy you as much as yourself. You are the only one who can destroy yourself. Let people say whatever they want, but keep on building. And trust your case in the hands of a righteous man. If that is clear, say amen. amen. Nehemiah kept on. No compromise. So what is the next line of attack? Let's look at it from verse 10. Uh, this is in your notes of point number C. Afterward, I came unto the house of Shemaiah, the son of Deliah, the son of Mahetabel, who was shut up. And he said, let us meet together in the house of God within the temple and let us shut the doors of the temple for they will come to slay thee. Yea, in the night they will come to slay thee. One day Nehemiah was building when he got a message from some close friends, Shemaiah, apparently a godly man. And the message was, Nehemiah, word has reached me that Tobiah, Sambalat, and the enemies want to assassinate you in the middle of the night. In fact, they want to do the same thing to me, so I am hiding over here in my house. Come, and let us all run and hide inside the temple so that they don't slay you. Watch how Satan uses friends in quotation marks. What was the response of Nehemiah? If you read verse 11, and I said, should such a man as I flee? And who is there that being as I am man would go into the temple to save his life? I will not go in. And lo, verse 12, I perceived that God had not sent him. But that he pronounced this prophecy against me, for Tobiah and Sambalat had hired him. Tobiah and Sambalat went and bribed these false prophets, actually a good man, bribed him. And a man's first response, I will not go in, because if I as a leader flee, what happens to the troops? They will all leave. But notice also verse 12, Nehemiah says, I perceived that God had not sent him. Therefore, verse 13, was he hide that I should be afraid and do so and sin, and that they might have matter for an evil report that they might reproach me. How did Nehemiah know that this friend, this prophet was lying? Any guess? Any guess? How did he know that this prophet was lying and he wanted him to sin? Sorry, I cannot hear you. The work will stop, but that doesn't mean he is lying. Well, in your notes, I put a little reference there. Numbers eighteen twenty-two. You can go back and read it. In Numbers chapter eighteen, verse twenty-two, the Bible says only a Levite or a priest could go inside the temple. Nehemiah was not a Levite. And so if he had gone inside the temple, he had broken God's commands. And he would have been stoned to death. He would have sinned and he would have been killed. Spiritual leaders need the gift of discernment. The only way you can Avoid being compromised is when you know the word of God. If Nehemiah had not known the word of God, he would have been compromised. Isaiah tells us, to the law and to the testimony, if they speak not according to this, there is no light in them. Dear friends, we are living at a time in the history of the world. Unless your mind is fortified with the truth of God's word, you cannot stand the deception that is underway. And before our own eyes, we are witnessing massive deception. All you need to do is watch the television screen. 
And it is even coming into our churches and people have no gift of discernment to know that error is being presented. This is a time for men of faith to saturate their minds with a thorough knowledge of the Word of God. Otherwise, Satan will not only say, come down, but he will say, come in. Your only shield is the Word of God. We must not come down, we must not respond, and definitely we must not go in. If that is clear, say amen. Amen. Have you noticed that it wasn't only one prophet that the enemies hired? If you keep reading, verse 14. This Nehemiah speaking. My God, think thou upon Tobiah and Sambalat according to these their works, and on the prophetess Noedia and the rest of the prophets that would have put me in fear. Nehemiah committed his case to the Lord again. Prayer. But notice, they also hired other prophetesses. The prophetess Noedia and other prophets in Jerusalem, they bribed them all so that they could compromise Nehemiah. He was saved by a thorough knowledge of the word of God, by a life of prayer, because then the Holy Spirit can speak to you even as you pray. And then he continued building. He never stopped. And that is what the next verses tell us. So the wall was finished in the 25th day of the month Elul in 52 days. And it came to pass that when our enemies heard thereof and all the heathen that were about us saw these things, they were much cast down in their own eyes for they perceived that this work was wrought of our God. 52 days. A work that lay there in ruins for 110 years. It took a cup bearer from Babylon. He wasn't a trained builder. But God had called him. He responded to the call by faith. Despite ridicule, despite opposition, despite all forms of compromise, this man kept on building. He kept his eye on the ball. He couldn't be compromised. And in 52 days, the wall was built. What do you say to that? There should be no compromise. We must always stand firm, even under pressure. God has a work to do. And then why says, to fight the battles of the Lord when the majority forsake us. To stand in defense of truth and righteousness when champions are few, this is our task. We must always be focused. What we are talking about, we are talking about spiritual leadership. It can be in the home, it can be in the church, it can be in your community, it can be wherever you are. God has called you as a leader. And once it is clear to you what your role ought to be, remain focused. Don't be deterred. Whatever the means is. If that is clear, say amen. Amen. Did Satan give up? No. Keep on reading. That leads us to point number D on your notes. And this is from verse 17. Moreover, in those days, the nobles of Judah sent many letters unto Tobiah, and the letters of Tobiah came unto them. For there were many in Judah sworn unto him, because he was the son-in-law of Shechaniah, the son of Arath, and his son Johanan, had taken the daughter of Meshulam and the son of Berechiah. Also they reported his good deeds before me, and uttered my words to him, and Tobiah sent letters to put me in fear. Satan never gives up. Even after the walls were built, and if you read the book, Nehemiah became governor for 12 years. But Satan did something. Nehemiah's inner circle, his church board, his cabinet ministers, anytime they went to board meeting, Satan planted spies right there at the board meeting. And whatever they discussed, these spies would leak it to the enemy, Tobiah. 
The nobles of Judah, you wouldn't have expected that church elders or pastors or whatever leaders would be working for Satan. But they were there. Kept a close eye on the words of Nehemiah and then leaked it to the enemy. And the enemy came out with another strategy. And then when Nehemiah would discuss it and say, brethren, we shouldn't do this. There's an enemy around. We shouldn't. And then according to the Bible, verse 19, they reported also his good deeds before me. They said, Nehemiah, why are you so angry and upset about Tobiah? Tobiah is not as bad as you paint him to be. He's a good man. You, you may disagree on methods. Your style may be different, but he's not as bad. Watch out in your committee meetings. Not everyone there is there to do God's work. Some are aligned to an enemy. It takes the gift of discernment. How did Nehemiah respond to this misrepresentation and misinformation also with prayer. Dear friends, we are talking about the strategy of the enemy. Time is running out. I briefly put in your notes because I want you to get a big a picture. Question number 12 on your notes under D. When you jump to chapter 13, Tobiah and Sabalat resurface again. By chapter 13, Nehemiah had finished his work reigned for 12 years as governor. Everything was going well. There had been a revival under Ezra, and people were typically really growing. And then Nehemiah took a leave, went back to his duty in Babylon or Persia. When he was gone, Tobiah Sambalat came back again. Look at Nehemiah chapter 13. Reading from verse 4. And before this, Eliashib, the priest, he was actually the high priest. Eliashib, the priest, having oversight of the chamber of the house of our God, was allied unto Tobiah. The high priest was allied with Tobiah, the enemy. And what did they do? Well, no, Haman was gone. Verse 5. And he had prepared for him a great chamber. Where at four time they laid the meat offering, the frankincense, the vessels, the tithes, the corn, the new wine, the oil, which was commanded to be given to the Levites, and the singers, and the porters, and the offerings of the priests. Verse 6. But in all this time I was not at Jerusalem, for in the two and thirtieth year of Athasis, king of Babylon, came I unto the king, and after certain days I obtained leave of the king. Verse 7. And I came to Jerusalem, and I understood of the evil that Eliashib did, for Tobiah in preparing for him a chamber in the courts of the house of God. Can you imagine this? A high priest actually took one of the rooms in the temple, the house of God. The room that used to store the tithe, the wine offering, and the wheat offering, everything, he cleaned it up and asked to buy the enemy to set up his office right in the temple. And if you read the account, people stop returning tithe. And so the priests and the Levites, they had no one to pay them. So they went back to farming. The work collapsed. Think of it this way. Let's say the general conference headquarters. We have an office for Osama bin Laden. I'm just thinking of something. It is unimaginable. But this is what happened. It is only the grace of God that has preserved this church. The absence of godly men can result in massive apostasy. To the point that godly men, godly leaders and ministers cannot execute God's work. Because when Tobiah is right there at headquarters, what will the godly people do? They abandon their work. In some of our schools, we don't get godly teachers because those in charge have aligned themselves with the enemy. Some of our churches and conferences and different levels of church work. There is a secret alliance between the enemy and leadership. Dear friends, the Bible has recorded this for our warning and for our instruction. Every phase of the work, from the moment God calls you, to the moment you assemble your resources, 
to the moment you begin, to the moment you are halfway, to the moment you are completed, to the moment you reign, to the very end, Satan never gives up. And you can read this account also in uh, existential terms as the life of a Christian. From the moment God, you give your heart to the Lord Jesus Christ, a battle begins. As you grow in grace, a battle rages on. To the very end, Satan would never give up. Your only security, the word of God, an intimate communion with the Lord Jesus Christ in prayer. Nehemiah was a man of prayer. He came to Jerusalem in this context, clean out the house, and in fact, if you read the account, the Bible says, verse 8, it grieved me sore. Therefore, I cast forth all the household stuff of Tobiah out of the chamber. And then he cleansed the whole place. Then he appointed godly men to be in charge. And then the Bible says, tithe and offering started flowing in. In some Positions of responsibility today, the places need to be cleaned out. Some churches, institutions are failing because we are not doing right. If we do right, God will bless us in our tithes and offerings. Something to think about. Well, they didn't quit. While Tobiah had aligned himself with the high priest and gotten an office at headquarters, Sambalat also planned another strategy, and you can read it in verse 28. Nehemiah chapter 13, verse 28. And one of the sons of Jehoiada, the son of Eliashib, the high priest, was son-in-law to Sambalat, the Horonite. Therefore, I chased him from me. Remember them, oh my God, because they have defied. Can you imagine Sambalat? Having a marriage alliance with the family of the high priest. And if you compare it to chapter 6, where Tobiah also had some nobles of Judah marry in his, in his home, marriage is one area Satan would compromise us. And everything about sexual immorality, bad relationship, divorce, all these pelvic issues are involved in the plan of the enemy. Satan would do everything possible. Intermarriage. You cannot take lightly what is happening in our churches today. We are living in the days of Sodom and Gomorrah. Everything would happen. It is another plan of the enemy. And this is reserved for the very last. Before Israel got into the promised land, you know what happened with the Midianite women. What makes us think it will not happen again? And right before our eyes, we are seeing all kinds of perverse relationships, even in the church. And so here are these Michigan men of faith. We are going to have a seminar on pornography and the rest. How to keep yourself pure. Another seminar. Adultery, divorce, and remarriage. And we even have the guts to revise our church manual to allow for divorce on unbiblical grounds. Something is happening. And God has recorded in his book for us the strategies of the enemy. You are going to discover Satan never gives up. He never backs down. Just like he tempted Jesus Christ, the Bible tells us. He tempted him, and when Jesus prevailed, the Bible says he left him for a short while. He will come back again with another ploy. And you find this in the book of Nehemiah. I wish time would have allowed us to go chapter by chapter. There you are going to discover a man of faith in the midst of the strategies of an enemy. This is a challenge we face. We have a foe, a deadly foe, who is watching every move, your personal life, 
your professional life, your academic life if you are a student, whatever area you find yourself, Satan has a plan for you. But the good news is, it is the Lord who has called you. He called you when you were way off in Babylon somewhere in Persia. He laid a burden on you because he has a mission for you. The walls are down. The gates are burned. God calls men and women to be repairers of the breach. That is a challenge to which we have been called. How can we succeed? How can we triumph? The book of Nehemiah, which begins with prayer and ends with prayer, tells us we can succeed first and foremost on our knees. And so if you read the end of chapter 13, perhaps I should read from verse 29. Remember them, O oh my God. That's one of the prayers. Because they've defiled the priesthood and the covenant of the priesthood and of the Levites. Thus cleansed I from all strangers and appointed all the walls of priests and the Levites, everyone in his business. Verse 31, the last verse in the book. And for the wood offering at times appointed and for the first fruits, remember me, O oh my God, for good. The book ends on prayer. It begins with prayer. And every part of the book is punctuated with prayer. How can you triumph? Be men of prayer. How can you triumph? Be men of the word. Nehemiah saved his life simply because he knew the word. Only those whose minds are fortified with the word of truth can prevail in these last days. How can you prevail? Remain focused. Remain true to duty. Remain vigilant. Keep committed. Keep on building. Let nothing deter you. How can you prevail? Avoid compromises. To dally around with our enemy in whatever dialogue it might be whether ecumenical or charismatic or whatever kind of dialogue, avoid it. Be wise. The pressure would come. Come, let us talk. We must always say, oh no, I have a great work for the Lord. How can you prevail? When Satan comes with his seductive deceptions in the gap of charismatic miracles and prophecies and false prophecies, that the Lord has shown me this. I have seen a dream. Let's have this prayer warrior, prayer worker, everything. By the way, I have a series uh, recorded, I think, by American cassette titled Signs and Wonders. I used to be a Pentecostal charismatic. You must know that. And this is coming into our church, and few people have the gift of discernment to know what is happening. When Satan comes with his deceptive seductions, come on in, our answer should be, I will not go in. We are repairers of the bridge. This is our challenge. In whatever area of life you may find yourself, if we follow in the steps of Nehemiah, we shall prevail even as he prevailed. Is that your wish? Is that your prayer? I will challenge you, go back home and study this book. Fascinating book. Getting to the end of the year, I'll be giving a series on this book. But you can discover it yourself. And I pray that we shall be indeed men of faith, even as Nehemiah was. If that's your wish, let us stand for prayer. Our Father in heaven, before you stands the men of Michigan. We are thankful for creating this avenue. Once a year, we gather around to study how we can be men of faith, men of prayer, men of the word, men of courage. Before you stand your people, each one of us in our own personal lives, family lives, recognize a need, a need to remain committed to stand firm under pressure, all kinds of pressure, we are thankful for opening to us the strategies of the enemy, laying before us his plan, and sharing with us how we can triumph. 
Make each one here standing on his feet. Make them victorious in Christ. May we not trust ourselves, our abilities, but to trust our Lord Jesus Christ daily. May this be our experience, for we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.